Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of imperialism, right? And the current lens that we're focusing in on right now with imperialism is we're discussing British imperialism of China, right? And so the big thing that we got into today in class, and also, by the way, good luck today in challenge. We're going to keep this flip 15 minutes or under, all right? 15 minutes or under, going to keep it nice and short and stuff like that so you don't have to worry about too much and you can get this bad boy done before tomorrow. C period, shout out y'all. Appreciate y'all being so chill about this, right? So the big thing about it, though, is we were focusing in on the British in China, right? We were talking about how the British were trading and actually exchanging opium for tea, basically creating and starting an illegal drug trade in the country of China to try and destabilize it before they would eventually come in and start a few wars, right? So the opium wars are going to mostly be started due to the fact that the Chinese government under the Xing dynasty is going to hire several different very, very well-educated and high-ranking officials to try and stop the importation of the opium into the shores, right? In through the ports, especially in through the ports of Canton. Now, the thing about it, though, we're looking at it has to do with the fact that you have, like, when they're trying to, like, stop this importation, what they're doing is they're seizing a lot of chests of opium at the ports. And what they do with these chests of opium, they destroy them, right? Well, the British are then going to demand compensation for the 21,000 chests of opium that will be destroyed during these search and seizures, right? So the thing about it, though, is, is Britain, I don't think you really get to say you want money for illegal drugs that you had no right to be trading in this area in the first place, right? So when we look at this as well, this is a letter that the Qing like, emperor actually wrote to Queen Victoria, the monarch of, your, or of England at the time, to try and get her to make the East India Company stop doing this. And apparently she never got it, right? So like now, which was absolutely ridiculous. Now the thing about it is when the Brits demanded compensation for their drugs and then the opium wars break out, because the Chinese government refuses to pay it, right? Now, the very first opium war ranged from about 1839 to about 1842, and the second one is going to range from about 1853 to 1860. Now, the second one is going to be started because of, like, arsenic and bread and, like, a lot of other pointing fingers and also the, like, couple revolts that are going to pop up and stuff like that. But what's going to end up happening is the British are going to open a doorway, right? They're going to open a doorway using their advanced military because the Chinese just did not have the technology necessary to fight the British off. Let's use this picture really quick as a good example of that, right? So when you're looking at this, these were Chinese naval ships going into this war, right? You, as you can tell, they are still wind-powered with sails, right? But this one right here is being detonated and exploded because it's just been shot by this British warship known as the HMS Nemesis, right? The HMS Nemesis right here, look at that smokestack right there. That bad boy is powered by a steam engine, right? It does not need wind. It has long-range cannons on the front of it. It will literally destroy anything that comes in its path, and it's fighting against an army that is still going into this with some bows and arrows and also swords and very limited firearms, if many at all, right? So the thing about it, though, is... Both of these wars will happen, and the Chinese would lose, okay? Because they are technologically very far behind the Brits. Oh, and by the way, we were involved as well by the Second Opium War. The Americans get involved, the French, and the Russians, right? Now, they get involved because they see an opportunity, right? Because what began after the Opium Wars was a period of time known as the Century of Humiliation, right? So, whoop, uh, messed up, messed up, messed up, messed up. Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Go back. Uh, there we go. So the thing about it is known as the century of humiliation because literally technologically advanced Brits with their guns and their expeditionary forces were fighting against people carrying shields, swords, and using technology that wasn't quite up to par. And the century of humiliation actually begins, okay, after these wars because basically the Chinese historians characterized it as a hundred years that would follow where the Europeans would show up and begin to impress upon the Chinese people unfair treaties, unequal treaties, and these things known as spheres of influence, right? So remember, China at the very beginning of this entire thing in the 1790s was economically very prosperous. They were also closed is what it's called, okay? They were closed, all right? They had the Canton system, and if you wanted their goods, you had to go to them, right? Well, now what's going to happen is China will be opened to European influence and spheres of influence would be established. What a sphere of influence is, is when Chinese ports, right, were going to be open to international trade merchants, okay? They weren't subject to Chinese laws. They were only subject to the own countries, their own country's laws, and China had to pay them. 
So this is what a sphere of influence looks like, okay? So you see all this green right here? Those are British spheres of influence, right? The area the Brits got out of these opium wars where they could actually suppress the Chinese people who lived there and actually use the, all their, like, ports to their advantage, okay? Japanese sphere right there. We'll talk about Japan a little bit later on, which is a very interesting little prospect. The French sphere down here in Indochina, which is now known as Vietnam. The German sphere right there, which is actually at the uh, corner of the Yellow Sea. And the Russian sphere is that well is right there. It's going to lead to a big war between them and Japan a little bit later on. Now, because of these spheres of influence and because of this century of humiliation of these unequal treaties that actually come down, where basically the Chinese are being forced to give up their land and their ports to other people, very large rebellions are going to break out, particularly one known as the Taipang Rebellion, which is going to claim the lives of over 20 million people when it was suppressed, and the Boxer Rebellion, which would be crushed by a coalition force of Americans, Russians, uh, British, French, and German troops would actually come in and destroy that rebellion as well. Rebellions are going to be a very, very big part of imperialism because the people that live there are going to actually try to rid their countries of foreign influence, right? So keep that in the back of your mind that that is going to be a consistent theme going forward, okay? These uprisings were crushed at the loss of millions of Chinese lives. Over 20 million people died in the Taiping Rebellion alone. It is absolutely insane that a group of people, especially Europeans with technological advancements, showed up and just suppressed these people completely and utterly for economic gains and also for the extension of their, like, their own country. So that right there, that's imperialism. Do you see what I'm talking about? This is imperialism of the 1800s, not colonialism, right? Colonialism was much, much different and a much different trend. Now we're moving out of the British in China, and we're now getting into this right here, the British in India, right? So the British, some of y'all are like, oh my God, was imperialism happening with anybody but the British? The British were very, 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 very much in the imperialism game, right? That's why they had that saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire, which is an absolutely disgusting saying in retrospect. So the thing about it that we have to understand is that Britain in India or British like involvement in India, it's a little bit different than it was in China, right? It was a little bit different, a kind of like intrinsically very different in a lot of ways because Europeans had been like nearby India since 1497, right? <clears throat> in 1497, Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese sailor, is going to go around the Cape of Good Hope in southern Africa. He's going to get all the way to India and all the way back with a huge shipment of spices, particularly in black pepper, right? And the thing about it, though, is that began the Portuguese trade network that would go around Africa consistently, right? Well, by the time the 1600s had rolled up, the British East India Company was created, and they wanted to go to India as well for the pursuit of spices and other goods, right? They would often sometimes, too, as well, going into the 1700s, they would actually use uh, Egypt as a thoroughfare, which is why Napoleon invaded it at one point. But what's going to happen is things are going to change as time goes on. By the 1700s, Britain is going to get into a huge competition with the Dutch and the French for the coast of India. Now, really, really quickly, if we look at this map of India right here, where they wanted to settle and gain access to were all the port cities on the edge of India. Why was that? Mostly due to the fact that the British, the Dutch, and the French could not venture into India itself because they could easily get malaria and they could die. Quinine medicine had not been invented just quite yet, right? They took over India, though, as the 1700s rolled around very quickly, right? Because they were very fragmented and they were not a unified country. Do y'all remember we talked about this back in the day? India was a fragmented society that was ruled by these princes known as Rajas, right? Well, they're still being ruled over by those Rajas, right? The Rajas still rule over them, and there used to be these very, very large empires that existed there. One known as the Mughal, and one known as the Ashoka Empire at one point, or Ashoka was actually the leader of the Mughal Empire. Now, the thing about it, though, in general, you need to understand, is that these different empires had gone to war with places like Persia and outside of Pakistan and things like that. And so their empires were shrinking, and because of this, the Brits saw it as an opportunity to invade into India and take over even more land, right? So why India, though? Like, right, why were they going to India and why did they have a desire if they were making all the money off spices and stuff like that like that was where they needed it all you need for the spices is a port city and stuff like that so why are you going any further well India was like taken advantage of mostly because it was so fragmented because the British could roll up there and make deals with local Indian Rajas that would benefit not only the British but the Rajas as well but as time progressed Spices began to saturate the market. The supply of spices back to Europe got so high that the cost on them went down. So the motivations for the British in India changed over time to growing things and using the fertile Indian soil to grow things like indigo, cotton, 
tea and opium, right? And what the British realized later on is that they can grow tea in India, but it really still wasn't at the same high quality as the Chinese tea that they wanted when the opium wars broke out, right? But indigo was a dye used for fabrics, and of course opium was used to trade to the Chinese, and cotton as well was used in that British Industrial Revolution. Now, indirect rule is going to be a big component of this as well. The British are going to show up, and they're actually going to suppress the Indian people by using their own rulers, all right? So when the British showed up, this is what we were talking about, they actually didn't just go in with their military like they did to China. They actually originally started by bribing and installing or forcing local rulers to enact British laws and policies, right? This right here, for example, is an example of indirect rule. This is a British commander of the military in the East India Company making a deal with a local Indian Raj, right? For like at trade port access and other access to good as well, goods as well. Because there was over less than a thousand British people in a country of over 300 million Indians ruling over them and suppressing them when the actual takeover of India began, right? So indirect rule is extremely important. But what we're going to talk about next class is we're going to talk about the effects of the British colonialism in India. And we're actually going to cut that off right there. We're going to keep this flip 10 minutes, actually. Because you know what? Y'all need to go to challenge. You need to go have a good time. Go do your thing. I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.